Today we are going to discuss what I think are the top 5 weird Soviet planes that actually flew. All the planes on this list are planes that have actually flown. There will be a mix of civil and military aviation from when the Soviet Union was initially formed around 1922 till 1991, which was when the Soviet Union broke down. One misconception we should get out of the way is that people think of the Soviets as behind in the race for technological progress. The truth cannot be further from this. For example, the Soviets were the first to make a rocket-powered fighter, the Bi-1. They also invented the first powered flying wing, the BICH-3. Even in the worst conditions, where scientists and engineers had to be worried about their lives constantly, they would persevere and make progress. They would not be put off by the fact that their lives could be forfeit if progress on a project didn't go as planned. Or, just for no reason, there would be a knock at the door in the middle of the night and nobody would ever hear from them again. This was most prominent during 1937, during Stalin's show trials of government officials. Let's set the scene on how bad it could be to work as a scientist or engineer in the Soviet Union. One example was the designer for the new Soviet 23mm autocannon. This new gun was going to be used on the Alusha IL-2. The designer was arrested on false charges of preserving samples of unfinished weapons and plotting production of unfinished and unsatisfactory weapon systems, namely the 23mm autocannon. He was later executed. Another example is Tupolev, the designer behind the An-25 and other planes that will be on this list. The An-25 was a plane capable of flying for 75 hours without refueling. This is pretty impressive for a plane that came out in the 1930s. Tupolev was falsely accused of using test flights to the United States to trade Soviet state secrets with the Americans. With a stage set, let's get on with the list. Number 5. The NIAIRK and its variants. With the RK configured for flight, this plane looks relatively normal. What makes this plane so interesting though is its ability to increase or decrease the surface area of the plane without flaps. The plane has four wings, which are used to support the telescopic wing, which extends out from the fuselage. This telescopic wing has the ability to be retracted or extended in mid-flight. A similar idea around the time of the RK was another plane called the NSIS, which was a biplane which had the ability for one of its wings to fold in after takeoff. The telescopic and folding wing designs are experiments into variable geometry aircraft. These aircraft have the ability to change their wing shape and surface area mid-flight for the situation that is needed. There are good reasons why a plane may want to change its wing shape or surface area mid-flight. When a plane is flying at level flight, air is running over the wings generating lift. If the pilot wanted the plane to go faster, the plane would run into some problems. More speed equals more drag, that's just basic physics. To go faster, more force from the engine would be needed. Here's where it starts to get interesting. The wing, due to high airflow, is not only generating more drag, but is also generating more lift the faster it goes. The plane would have to pitch its nose downwards to stay in level flight. To do this, the plane would need to use its elevator, the control surface at the back of the plane, which helps steer the plane when going up or down. Using the elevator will create more drag as it's deflecting air downwards to push the tail back up, therefore pitching the nose back down. With enough speed, the elevator will not be able to deflect enough air to keep the nose down. To get around this problem, some modern jets have variable swept wings. At high speeds, when an aircraft needs less lift as it's going very fast, the wings are only slowing the aircraft down by generating drag and lift. By having the wing fold back and towards the fuselage at high speeds, the plane can reduce drag and lift and thus increase its maximum speed further. This is only one advantage of variable geometry aircraft. The advantage I described was for achieving higher speeds in flight. Another reason for telescopic wings is for a shorter takeoff length. During takeoff, a plane needs to be able to move fast enough for its wings to generate sufficient lift. For a plane with tiny wings, the plane would have to go very fast to take off, in comparison with a plane that has very large wings. The RK could utilize its telescopic wings to achieve a takeoff from short airfields. After takeoff, when less lift is needed, the wings can be retracted for higher speeds or better fuel economy, which in turn leads to increased flight range. There are many examples of planes trying new ways to shorten their takeoff. An example being of biplanes with a folding wing. The idea behind this design is to have the mobility and short takeoff length of a biplane, but in flight have the speed of a monoplane, better known as a single wing plane. The design of this plane allowed for extra lift on takeoff, and then in flight you fold one of the wings in, and you get increased higher top speed. 
There was even a fighter variant of the RK. This plane had twin 20mm auto cannons and twin light machine guns. Its maximum speed was 150 km per hour. The RK project came to a halt in 1940 due to unreliable engine troubles. Also, Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of Russia by Germany, didn't really help too much either. Number 4. The KM, better known by its nickname, the Caspian Sea Monster. The Caspian Sea Monster is an Akrana plan. Although Akrana plans are technically not classed as planes even though they fly, I still think they deserve a spot on this list. An Akrana plan moves above the water by taking advantage of ground effect. Ground effect is a cushion of air that forms under planes when at flying at low altitude. Planes will experience this effect just before landing. When a plane comes into land, the pilot will raise the nose of his plane to enter a state of flight called the flare. This slows the plane's forward speed down and the descent rate. The flare cannot be held for too long as the plane's forward speed becomes too slow and the plane would enter a stall, dropping from the sky like a stone. Pilots do this just as they're landing to achieve the slowest speed that their plane is capable of before landing. Look at any landing footage and you will always notice the raised nose that all planes have as they land. The Caspian Sea Monster was a beast of a plane weighing 240 tons and was almost 100 meters long. The maximum takeoff weight was just over 540 tons which gives it a huge lifting capacity. Even a modern 747-8 only has a maximum takeoff weight of 450 tons. The Caspian Sea Monster was made back in 1966. The 747 I compared it to was made in 2010. That's a 44 year time gap. For its weight and size, the KM was by no means slow, with a top speed of 460 miles per hour. That's what makes the Krana plan so interesting. They are capable of moving massive amounts of weight at very high speeds. The KM was only one of several Akrana plans. Lund class Akrana plan was a class of Akrana plans that were not as big as the KM, but they were still huge. Three Lund class Akrana planes were made, but only one still exists in a dock in southern Russia. It is so huge you can see it easily on Google Maps, which is a great segue into how the KM actually got its nickname, the Caspian Sea Monster. During the Cold War, spy planes from Western world powers were flying over the Soviet territories gathering data. When the CIA saw pictures of this new prototype plane, they were initially confused as they thought the plane must be still under construction due to the short wings. After its discovery, a reconnaissance drone was allocated just to spy on the KM. The CIA gave the KM the nickname the Caspian Sea Monster as it was the biggest plane in the world at the time and it was also based in the Caspian Sea. The surviving Lund class Akrana plane was armed with six anti-ship missiles. You can see the tubes containing the missiles on top of the main fuselage. These missiles were powerful enough to destroy aircraft carriers. The Akrana plane would have engaged in a hit and run style Flying fast over the ocean, avoiding sea mines and submarines, but also flying so low that radar wouldn't be able to detect it. It would use its speed to probe the weak spots in a carrier's defensive screen. A carrier's defensive screen is made up of ships surrounding the carrier with the purpose of stopping anything from destroying the aircraft carrier as it's normally the core for naval operations. When the Akrana plan was in range, it would fire its missiles and then fall back. The uncompleted Lund class Akrana plans would have been fitted to either be troop transports or mobile field hospitals. There are also other Akrana plans that have been made. I could go into more detail, but if we did, we'll be here all day. For all the advantages Akrana plans had, they came with quite a few downsides. The Akrana plans weren't really too friendly on their crews as there was a lot of noise and vibration from the massive engines they had. They were also fairly difficult to steer left and right and there was a danger they could lose control and suddenly roll over at high speeds. And what I think is the biggest disadvantage is that the Akrana plants could only be used on calm water, such as the Caspian Sea. They wouldn't have fared too well on the ocean where large waves form. Sadly, the KM was destroyed in a test flight accidentally. Luckily there was no casualties though. The funding for the Akrana plants project was slowly reduced over time, stopping the development of planes in production. Funding for research and development of the Akrana plants was also cut. If funding had continued, maybe they could have found a way to solve the disadvantages and problems the Akrana plans had. Number 3. The Alusha IL-20 1948 When trying to pick a plane for number 3 spot on this list, I had to narrow it down from 3 other IL planes. The planes were the IL-20, the IL-40 and the IL-102. They all bear a striking resemblance to the IL-2, an iconic World War II ground attack plane. The design idea behind the IL-2 was to build a plane that could attack enemy ground units. 
To do this, the IL-2 was given 23mm autocannons, machine guns, rockets and bombs. When ground attacking in a plane like this, the pilot is exposing the plane to light arms and ground fire. Light arms would include machine guns, heavy and light, and also small AA guns such as Nazi Germany's 20mm and 37mm anti-aircraft guns. To protect the IL-2 and its two-man crew, the plane was given armour plating all around the pilot and rear gunner. There was also armour plating around the engine and radiator cooler. Thick bulletproof glass for the pilot would ensure that he wouldn't be killed when attempting a strafing run. The fuel tanks were also not located in the wing, but actually located inside the main body of the plane, inside the armoured bathtub that surrounded the crew. The fuel tanks were capable of sealing themselves if they took direct hits from enemy fire. With all these features, the survivability of the IL-2 was surprisingly high for a World War II plane. There was a reason it earned itself the nickname, the Flying Tank. German Luftwaffe pilots nicknamed the IL-2 as the Concrete Bomber. One IL-2 was reported to have returned safely back to base, despite receiving 600 direct hits and having all of its control services completely shredded, as well as numerous holes throughout the plane. You get the point I've been hammering. It's a tough plane. Nearing the end of World War II, the Ilusha II was getting old, so it was time for a new replacement ground attack plane for the Soviet Air Force. Here's the thing though, the IL planes never actually seemed to change their design. The IL-2, the IL-8, the IL-10, the IL-16, the IL-20, the IL-40 and even the IL-102, which also did its first flight in 1982, still looks like an IL-2 which was made in 1940. They kept the spirit of the design, the idea of the pilot and one gunner in the rear. The IL-20 was a Soviet experimental ground attack plane. Only one was ever made and it had its first test flight near the end of 1948. The weirdest thing at first glance is the design choice of having the pilot above the engine. This gives the plane a massive nose. They chose this design for a good reason. It was to increase the pilot's visibility when ground attacking. Another weird feature that is less noticeable is the four main guns. All 23mm autocannons could be depressed up to 23 degrees downwards. This would allow the plane to fly level and attack ground targets without it having to enter a dive or point its nose directly at what it was trying to attack. The Ilusha 20 was capable of also carrying rockets under the wings and also had an internal bomb bay. Just like previous IL planes, the IL-20 was heavily armoured. The pilot and rear gunner were surrounded with armour that was up to 15mm thick. The forward window for the pilot was 100mm thick armoured glass with 65mm on the sides. The rear gunner controlled a twin 23mm autocannon that faced rearwards. This would help to deter any planes flying to intercept the IL-20. The last defensive weapon I should mention is the 10 AG-2 aerial grenades. These were essentially aerial mines. These are grenades that would be dropped by the IL-20 and any plane unlucky enough to be behind the IL-20 would be hit by a blast that had an effective radius up to around 30 to 35 meters. The area of effect would be directly behind the IL-20 and just a little bit down. Although the IL-20 is a neat plane, there's several reasons why it was never put into mass production. The plane was very slow. The massive weight of the plane combined with the large nose meant the plane had a very low speed, even slower than the plane it was meant to be replacing. With the jet age just around the corner, planes with propellers were becoming less favourable. There were also a couple of design faults that probably didn't help. The engine had severe vibration issues and also access for the engine was rather difficult. Another problem was actually the design of the plane itself. By having the cockpit above the engine, if the plane needed to make a belly landing, that's a no gear landing, the propeller would probably bend backwards during the landing and hit the cockpit. That doesn't really help with the survivability of the pilot if he has to make an emergency landing. The program for the IL-20 was cancelled in 1949, just one year after the first version of it flew. Number 2. The TU-144, also known as the Concordski. If I was to ask you what was the first supersonic passenger plane, the answer that most people would say is the Concorde. That's where you're wrong. The first supersonic passenger jet was actually the Soviet Tu-144. It flew two months before the Concorde did. There's just one thing that is slightly off about the Tu-144. It looks quite similar to the Concorde. There's quite a bit of evidence that the Tu-144 was just a copy of the Concorde. There's a lot of talk about spies, misinformation, secret files, a lot of stuff straight out of a James Bond film. Although one story I must tell is of a Soviet spy that was working on developing the Concorde. The spy was trying to find out what materials the tyres of the Concorde were made up of. Western scientists made a new synthetic material 
just for the purpose of confusing the Soviets. The material was close to bubblegum in texture. The Soviets were led to believe that this substance was scraped off the runway skid marks produced by the Concorde when landing. I hate to think about the poor Soviet engineers that were tasked with building a tyre which could support the weight of a Concorde out of basically bubblegum. The TU-144 wouldn't be the first time the Soviets copied a plane design. We're going to wind back the clock of history back a bit, back to World War II. This plane is the TU-4. It may look familiar to some people, even though they may not be that familiar with World War II planes. That is because the TU-4 is a copy of the iconic American B-29. The B-29 is most known for being the first plane to drop an atomic weapon used in warfare. The Soviets had three B-29s in their possession. They fell into Soviet hands when they were damaged and had to make emergency detours to land in Russia. Stalin liked the B-29s as they were a solution to the lack of Soviet long-range bombers. It was decided by high command that these three B-29s would be used to reverse engineer the B-29. One of these B-29s was taken apart piece by piece down to the last screw. Each part was catalogued in detail. Details such as where the part was taken out, located in the plane, and how it was made. The second B-29 was left intact to be a reference model. The third B-29 was assigned for Russian pilots to begin learning how to fly the plane and to begin the training of pilots for the TU-4 when it was completed. The lead engineer in charge of building the TU-4 was frustrated to be working on an American plane. He knew trying to rebuild the plane without the documents would take a very long time. Tupolev thought their efforts could be used to design and build two new Soviet planes instead of rebuilding just one American plane. For all the odds, the Soviets actually pulled off a one-to-one -one copy of the B-29. It's an amazing feat, building a whole airplane from scratch without the original design is very impressive. The total weight of the TU-4 was under a 1% difference from the B-29. While it was proven that the TU-4 is a copy, there is no concrete proof that the TU-144 is a copy of the Concorde. One of the Concordski's biggest differences to the Concorde were the little wings near its nose. Those little wings allowed the TU-144 to land at lower speeds than the Concorde. At high speeds, those wings could actually be folded backwards to become flush with the fuselage. The second biggest difference with the Concorde is the engine placement. On the Concorde ski, the engines are located much closer to the fuselage than they are on the Concorde. The Concorde and TU-144 were unveiled to the world for the first time at the Paris Air Show in 1973. On the third day of the show, both planes participated to demonstrate to the media, public and investors the capability of their planes. During the TU-144's display, the plane when climbing upwards suddenly levelled off and then entered a steep dive. The pilot attempted to pull out of the dive but in doing so overstressed the airplane by pulling up too hard, causing a mid-air breakup. The accident was officially put down to the cameraman on board dropping his camera in such a way that it jammed the control column forward. With the control column jammed, the pilot wouldn't have been able to pull out of the dive until it was too late. Now, here's where it starts getting a bit fishy. Supposedly, the black box was destroyed, which is very unlikely to happen. Black boxes are built to be very tough and durable. The black box should have been able to survive a crash where the plane directly nosedived into the ground. And in this case, the plane broke up in mid-air. A mid-air breakup has a lot less force and impact than a direct crash. The main theory of what actually happened there was a French plane that was attempting to secretly take photos during the demonstration flight of the Concorde ski. The TU-144 levelled out during the climb to avoid collision with the French jet that was taking the photos. By levelling out too quickly, the engine suffered negative g-force, leading to fuel starvation. With the engines failing, the pilot put the plane into a dive in an attempt to get airflow through the engines to assist with restarting them. The pilot may have been distracted with restarting his engines before he noticed a lack of altitude too late. It is thought that there was cooperation between the French and the Soviet Union to cover up what truly happened. After the failure of the TU-144 at the Paris Air Show, it was confined to internal flights within the Soviet Union. Only 17 Konkordskis were ever built, and they only ever flew a handful of passenger flights. It was just too expensive to run, and it fizzled out of service. With the failure of the Konkordski, you would think that Concorde wouldn't have had a hard time getting to market. One of the main problems that the Concorde had was the operating cost. The steep cost of operating, as well as the plane's narrow market to wealthy customers, made it a hard product to sell. They were trying to sell the Concorde at the same time that the Boeing 747 was being produced. It was much more easier to sell tickets to a larger market of tourists than to a smaller market of rich, wealthy individuals or even businessmen. 
Other factors such as not being allowed to do supersonic flight over any land, even desert, certainly didn't help. Bizarrely, NASA actually brought a TU-144 to use as an experiment platform for research. The TU-144 that they brought was one of three that was in storage. The inside was completely reworked for NASA's needs. It flew 27 flights in total between 1996 and 1997. Number 1. The TB-3 Oh Jesus, where to start with this thing? There's so many talking points, I don't really know where to start. Its landing gear was made from railway track wheels that didn't have any brakes. The TB-3 was used in a project called the Zveno Project. The aims of this project was to create a platform for parasite fighters. The idea was that the TB-3 could take smaller fighter planes to the combat zone, and when at the combat zone the fighters would detach and could attack enemy ground units with bombs or other planes, depending on what loadout it took. When the fighters were low on fuel, they could reattach to the mothership plane, in this case the TB-3, and then the TB-3 would fly back home again for refueling and rearming. The TB-3 was also used to deploy paratroopers. Notice the lack of any fancy doors here, just off the wing you go. If we look next at the defences of the TB-3, the whole plane was covered in machine guns, and even if enemies were trying to attack from underneath, they weren't safe there either. Under the wings, in essentially buckets, were men manning machine guns. The whole plane was open-topped, so I hope you brought your warm jacket so you don't get too cold up there. Oh yeah, and it could be used to deploy flying tanks. Or, if needed, the TB-3 could fly at low altitude and drop them. But, the TB-3 is not the real number one. No. We're going to take it to the next level with the TB-3's big brother, the Ant-20. Also known as Maxim Gorky. This plane was the next evolution for the TB-3. The Ant-20 is massive for a plane that was introduced in 1934. It's still massive by today's standards. The wingspan is bigger than the first variant of the 747 Jumbo Jet. The Ant-20 was powered by 8 engines, 3 on each wing and 2 above the main fuselage. What I find most fascinating about this plane is the philosophy of how it was meant to be used. This plane wasn't built to drop bombs or deploy troops, it was built as a mobile propaganda office. This plane could be used as a tool to gain control in isolated regions of the Soviet Union by spreading the word of the Polybureau. It was to be used as the flagship of the aviation propaganda program. The whole plane was decked out to be a massive mobile propaganda office. It had things such as a darkroom for developing photos, a printing press, an internal phone system so the rooms could communicate with each other, speakers powerful enough to relay messages from the plane to people on the ground. It even carried a projector setup with a screen that was carried along with the plane that could be used to display the footage from the projector. Very useful for small villages that didn't yet have theatres, as film was relatively new at the time. It was also the first Soviet plane to have an autopilot. This plane was meant to be a show of Soviet might and engineering to other nations, a would-be muscle flexing contest. Who could have the biggest plane, who could fly the furthest, who could carry the biggest load. Kind of like the space race, except with planes. Unfortunately, during a demonstration flight of the Ant-20 over Moscow, an accompanying fighter plane flying in formation crashed into the Ant-20 when attempting a series of loops around it. The plane was completely destroyed. All the passengers and even some bystanders on the ground were killed. A replacement Ant-20 was ordered for production. This plane was a slight variant of the Ant-20. It was called the Ant-20 Bis. The most prominent new feature about this variant was the six engines instead of the original eight due to advancements in engine technology. Sadly, the Bis variant also crashed. On December 1942, an An-20 Bis was transporting passengers on a fairly regular route. The pilot let one of the passengers sit in his seat, and that passenger accidentally disengaged the autopilot, causing the plane to go into a nosedive. It still blows my mind though how big this plane is. Look at those rooms inside the wings. The wings are so huge, they had rooms inside them! Printing press, sleeping quarters, there's even a viewing area just about halfway into the wing. This isn't the first plane to make use of the wings for passengers and cargo, but I still find it very fascinating. It's just something you don't see on modern planes. Well, there you have it. Those are my top 5 weirdest Soviet planes that actually flew. Leave a comment on what planes you think should have been on this list. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. If you want to see more videos like this in the future, then perhaps subscribe. I'm going to point you towards two videos which I think you would enjoy if you like this one. They're on the screen right now. One of them is my top 5 weird Nazi wonder weapon planes that actually flew and the other is wood-powered tanks. Thanks for watching.